Happy Sunday. Thank you for being with me this morning. It's a beautiful day at Red Arrow. Happy to have the privilege of bringing Red Arrow to you on this day. I wish you all well. Notes of diversity and inclusion. How far you go in life depends on you being tender with the young, compassionate with the age, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because one day in life, you will be all of these things. George Washington Carver. Wouldn't it be terrible? Wouldn't it be sad? If just one single color was all the color we had? If everything was purple, or red, or blue, or green? If yellow, pink, or orange was all that could be seen? Can you just imagine how dull world will be if just one single color was all we got to see? I can almost see it, that dream I'm dreaming, but there's a voice inside my head saying you'll never reach it. Every step I'm taking, every move I make feels lost with no direction. My faith is shaken, but I, I gotta keep trying, gotta keep my head held high. There's always gonna be another mountain, I'm always gonna wanna make it move, I'm always gonna have an uphill battle. Sometimes I'm gonna have to lose Ain't about how fast I get there Ain't about what's waiting on the other side It's a climb The struggles I'm facing chances I'm taking sometimes might knock me down but no I'm not breaking I may not know it but these are the moments that I'm gonna remember most just just gotta keep going I I gotta be strong and on. There's always gonna be another mountain I'm always gonna wanna make it move Always gonna be an uphill battle Sometimes I'm gonna have to lose Ain't about how fast I get there Ain't about what's waiting on the other side It's climb always gonna be another mountain I'm always gonna wanna make it move always gonna be an uphill battle sometimes I'm gonna have to lose ain't about how fast I get there ain't about what's waiting on the other side it's a climb It's climb.
I love bicycles. I love everything about a bicycle. So much so that cycling is a significant part of my life as hobby and exercise. Whether I bike amongst the trees on a trail or on a quiet country road, I find great satisfaction in the simplicity of turning the pedals to self-propel me wherever I choose to go. It is a beautiful thing, really. No reliance on gas or batteries. Just a simple chain and gears powered by my legs. Sometimes I like to challenge myself and ride fast. Maybe even compete in a race occasionally. And other times I like to take it easy and ride so that I can look around and take in the beauty of my surroundings. Cycling has brought me a world of great friendships and experiences as well. I've taken my spills and share of flat tires but I get back on the saddle. Yes, in cycling, we refer to the seat as a saddle. And I ride on so that I can feel the freedom it provides me. To me, cycling is not just a sport, but a vessel that gives me space to think more clearly and thoughtfully about the world around me. That simple pedal motion taking me far to places mentally and physically. I bet you too, have that something inside of you that awakens you when you give all of yourself to it, whether that be a sport or a hobby. Living in the moment to your fullest potential. Free as a bird. But what if that simple freedom wasn't free at all? The bicycle was invented in 1817, but it was at the dawn of the 20th century that cycling was the most popular sport in both America and Europe, with tens of thousands of spectators drawn to arenas and velodromes to see highly dangerous and even deadly affairs that bore little resemblance to bicycle racing today. In brutal six-day races of endurance suffered from sleep deprivation, delusions, and hallucinations, along with falls from their bicycles. In motor pace racing, cyclists would draft behind motorcycles, reaching speeds of 60 miles per hour on cement banked tracks where blown bicycle tires routinely led to spectacular crashes and even death. Yet one of the first sports superstars that emerged from this high risk, two wheeled self propelled sport considered the high speed the least of the personal risk he would endure in his cycling career. Marshall W. Taylor was born into poverty in Indianapolis in 1878. He was one of eight children in his family. His father, Gilbert, the son of a Kentucky slave, fought for the Civil Union in the Civil War and then worked as a horse carriage driver for a wealthy family in Indiana. This family gave Taylor a bicycle and the young man was soon earning money as a paper boy, delivering newspapers and riding barefoot for miles a day. In his spare time, he practiced tricks and caught the attention of someone at a local bike shop, which eventually paid Marshall to hang around the front of the store, dressed in an oversized military costume, doing tricks, mounts, and stunts to attract business to his storefront. A new bicycle and a raise enabled Marshall to quit delivering newspapers and work full-time for the shop. His uniform won him the nickname Major, which stuck. To further promote the store, the shop owner entered Major in a 10-mile bicycle race, something that the cyclists had never seen before. I know you can't go the full distance, said the shop owner, as he whispered to terrified Major Taylor, but just ride up the road a little way. It will please the crowd, and you can come back as soon as you get tired. The crack of a starter's pistol signaled the beginning of an unprecedented career in bicycle racing. Major Taylor pushed his legs beyond anything he'd imagined himself be capable of, and finished six seconds ahead of anyone else. There, he collapsed and fell in a heap in the middle of the road. But he soon had a gold medal pinned to his chest. 
he began competing in races across the Midwest while he was still 13. His cycling prowess earned him a notice in the New York Times, which made no mention of his youth. But it was not Taylor's youth that cycling fans first noticed when he edged his wheels to the starting line in those early races in the late 1800s. It was his skin color. You see, Major Taylor was black. Major was the first black young man to ever compete in a bicycle race in history at a time where winning his race was at times literally a matter of life and death. You see, many competitors and spectators around Major were not supportive of him simply because of his skin color. Some of the other riders were friendly with Taylor and had no problems pacing him on a tandem bicycle for a time trial, but most other of his competitors did not want to compete alongside him in a real race at first. He was eventually given the opportunity, but with a catch. In his first race, he knocked more than eight seconds off the mile track record, with the crowd roaring when they learned of his time. After a rest, he came back on the track to see what he could do in the one fifth mile race. The crowd tensed as Taylor reached the starting line. Stopwatches were pulled from pockets. He exploded around the track and at age 17, knocked two fifths of a second off of the world record. But Taylor's record breaking time sadly could not be turned in for official recognition because of his skin color. But everyone in attendance knew what they had seen. Major Taylor was a force on two wheels. Newly nicknamed the Black Cyclone, Major's career was not without threat. He regularly endured physical and emotional punishing experiences of racing while bottles were thrown at him from the stands. His competitors at times physically jostling with him to push him off his bike during a race at high speeds. On two occasions, the black cyclone was threatened with a knife before a race and physically choked for several minutes before losing consciousness. Could his competitors not accept the fact that Major was a stronger cyclist than them? Or was it that they simply could not accept that his skin color was different than theirs, therefore making him a lesser man in their eyes? Or was it both? However, in spite of the racial driven threats and physical attacks, the cyclone would eventually keep his eyes on his handlebars and, fin and the finish line with a tremendous test of courage. He knew he was the best cyclist and would do all he could to keep pedaling towards justice and fair treatment for himself and other people of color at the time. And thank goodness he stuck with it. Major ultimately burst to fame as the world champion of his sport. Taylor raced for the rest of the decade, reportedly earning $30,000 a year. And now that, that was a lot of money back then. It made him one of the most wealthiest athletes of his day, black or white. Yes, Marshall Taylor loved riding a bicycle, so much so that he was willing to risk his life in the pursuit of racial equality. Major's pursuit shown an amount of courage that goes beyond our typical reasons for seeking courage here at Red Arrow Camp. We have the comfort of being instructed, encouraged, and supported with all levels of our efforts in all we do at camp and on the trail or river. At camp, we have the comfort of knowing we are accepted and embraced for who we are, no matter where we come from or the way we look. At camp, we have the comfort of having equal opportunity to fail without ridicule at camp. But what about when we are not at camp? The fact of the matter is, is that even though camp is our second home, we all know that our primary homes and greater society present challenges that go far beyond the swim pier or Day Lake Road. 122 years after Marshall Taylor swung his legs over his first bike saddle for the thrill and freedom of riding a bike, some people of color are still being judged, not 
for who they are on the inside, rather what they look like on the outside. Major knew that life is kind of like a bicycle. To remain balanced, you must keep moving forward. In its purest form, as humans, we all want fairness in each step we take in life. But I would suggest that fairness is not enough. Fair doesn't mean giving every person the same thing. It means giving every person what they need. Fairness is also protecting yourself, but also, and more importantly, protecting others. Here at camp, certainly, but most importantly, in your everyday lives. Your voice and your heart are the most powerful tools you can use to encourage fairness and equality for everyone in the world around you. Strong people stand up for themselves, but stronger people stand up for others. As you walk the trail of life now and forever, I challenge you to seek out opportunity to help promote a world where one does not judge a man or a woman for their skin, rather judgment for their character and heart. Amen. May the peace of the forest, the song of the birds, the inspiration of the hills, the warmth of the sun, the strength of the trees, the fragrance of the woods, the joy of the wind, the calm of the lake, in all of which is the creator of all good things, be in your hearts today and always.